be very, very quiet. I'm hunting wabbits. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Dennis Gebhardt here with Guru Nation, and happy Valentine's Day to all of you. Hope you have great plans for today. Hope you're going to do something with the one who means the most to you. And uh, for those that you're not and you haven't been able to be with, I hope you're sending them at least a note, letting them know you're thinking about them. So we are here today, and it is Rabbit Trails time. And I'm here with my good friend, my partner in crime, Max Marciano. Max, how you doing, brother? Hey, man, I'm all right. How are you, Dennis? I'm good, man. Happy Valentine's to you guys. Hope you, uh, Same are, to you. Same have to you some guys. plans to enjoy the day. How's the weather back there in Bostonian? It is gray and ugly. Hey, well, there you go. <laughs> it's kind of gray here, too. So what can I tell you, man? It's uh, Hey, but it isn't snowing yet, so I'm, I'm doing okay. Good. You know, I got a letter from my, a note from my granddaughter today. She lives in Texas in Plain, uh, in Grand Prairie, just outside of Dallas. And she goes, we got snow, we got snow. And she sent us pictures and it was just a dusty, it was like just barely covering the ground. And so Sylvia goes, why well, you didn't really get snow. <laughs> you got a dusting. <laughs> and she writes back, well, there's going to be more coming. And I go, okay, great. <laughs> So my, my great granddaughter's out there in the snow, making the snow angels. And it was really fun to see that this morning because they got so excited I that, mean, they, that they got snow. See, I got stuck in Dallas one time because of bad weather. It was, I think it was quite a few years ago. I was going back to the East coast, flew from California to DFW. When we landed in DFW, the runways were so iced over it was like, you know, it was like you were rolling on rocks, you know, as you were going down wow. the runway. It was like being on an alien planet. And so I called my son and he came and got me. And, you know, so I had to stay with them overnight. They'd shut down the airport. And around DFW, I don't know where the, how many people have been around DFW, but there is a ton of roadways that freeways that are built there. And they're, you know, they're, they're on an incline and they go up and so we're driving on these roadways and we're watching trucks sliding backwards down the road, you know, because they can't control their vehicles. Um, it was pretty frightening, but um, it's one of those experiences you never forget. You live to tell the tale. Amen, brother. Amen. All right. So look, we got some things on the calendar today to talk about. Um, one of the things I thought would be really good today is uh, I've, I, of course I've got some little, clips and things like this I want to share at the end of our segment but um, you know last week we talked about the color wheel and um, we talked about what people call underlying pigment and what people call you know remaining pigment contribution whatever you call it uh, I thought maybe this week we'd talk a little bit about formulating and, and the reason is because that's what I see on social media is that people are always asking for a formula they're asking for a recipe. They're saying, which brand covers gray the best? I saw that the other day on a forum that I am part of, but I don't really contribute because I have to be very careful at what I say because <laughs> I'll get in trouble. And, uh, and I felt like writing on this to this person and going, all hair color will cover gray. And it will in some degree. <laughs> it may not be the color you want, but it's like, that's such a blanket statement that <clears throat> people think that one brand is designed to cover gray better than another. Now, seriously, I don't care who they are. Um, I don't care what brand you use. Do you really think the color chemists sat down in their meeting room and said, hey, let's make a color that doesn't work? Do you think they really said that? <laughs> I don't think they said that. I'm sure they all had a desire to create a color that would perform well. You know, I said that for many years when I worked for, for a manufacturer. I said, look, in the laboratory, we test all these products and they work wonderful. But something happens between the time they leave the laboratory, go to production, go to marketing, and they get to you. Suddenly now they no longer cover gray hair. Suddenly, they no longer lighten the hair. 
suddenly people are breaking out and having sensitivity issues. I just didn't, I just don't get it. How does that happen? There's somewhere there's a break there. I know where the break is. Us. We're the break. 95% of the problem with hair color is us. <laughs> it's User how, error. Yes. <clears throat> it's how I, I've always said, you know, no matter what brand you love, if you think it's wonderful for the hair and all of that, you know, can you destroy hair with hair color? Yes. No matter whose hair color it is, you can damage hair with hair color. So don't say, well, this one doesn't damage hair as much as this one does. The fact is, hair coloring is damaging. <laughs> hair coloring is changing the structure. So I think formulation would be something good for us to talk about. Uh, those people who've been in my classes, they know that I have a, a unique way of thinking about formulation. <laughs> uh, but you know what, Max? It's the way I was trained. It was the way I was brought up. And it's, it's worked for me for over 40 years. Uh, it's actually worked for colorists who've attended my classes. <laughs> so obviously there must be something to it, but there's more than one sure. way to formulate. Everybody kind of has their way of getting there. My goal is that they have a pathway. In other words, they're not like using a machete and just trying to figure it out every time. You know, what do I do now? How do I get out of this problem? They go from one problem to another. Dear friend of mine, he, he used to say, when I learned hair color, I thought you had to screw hair up first and then make it right because that's what I always did. I screwed it up and then I corrected it. And then we were finally at a successful result. So uh, I thought maybe today you and I could kind of share uh, our formulation thought process, what we think about. And, sure. and then maybe you guys can find something and, you know, maybe... Max can share with you the way he looks at things. I can share with you the way I look at things. And maybe together you can find a little bit from each one of us that might help you when you're formulating hair color. So Max, why don't you go ahead and uh, take the lead on this one today. And I'll, uh, I'll sit here and drink a little bit more coffee because it's still okay. morning for me. <laughs> and then when, so, when you get finished, I'll, I'll jump in. Okay. Sounds great. Hi, brother. Um, so, so normally the first thing that I am going to do uh, prior to anything after I sit down, sit my client down in the chair, get her gowned, you know, introduce myself, et cetera, I will typically just say to her, I'm just going to take a couple minutes and just have a look at your hair. And that is typically my time to assess, you know, what's going on at our new growth what happened just previously, you know, like if you're uh, retouching a new growth. So I will mm -hmm. always look at whatever sort of, you know, band of hair color that's closest or the most recently applied. And then also look at, you know, the, the remainder of the lengths and ends of the hair. At the same time, I'm also kind of assessing, um, the condition of the hair, mm -hmm. how does it feel, you know, also assessing the texture of the hair because texture is going to uh, also affect how I'm going to formulate, like based on if the hair is fine or if it's more on the coarse side. Um, I then will typically have a look at my client's skin tone mm -hmm. and eye color. And, you know, I'm not sure about how it is in, um, I almost said Texas, but that's because you were talking about Texas, California. <laughs> but yes, here, California. here in the Northeast, a lot of people spray tan mm -hmm. and it's really hard to, well, I mean, this could be like a whole conversation anyway. Basically you have a person who's dying their skin Right. So, you know, you can, you can give somebody a, a, you can try to assess someone's actual skin tone. I mean, but if they're going to be tan 99% of the time, you kind of have to do it to their, right. 
dyed skin tone, in my opinion, because if that's oh, not going to change, yeah, you know. So, so I, I first kind of do what I like to say is a visual inventory. Mm-hmm. So look at the new growth, look at the mid links, look at the ends, note down any percentage of white, the natural level, the artificial color levels, you know, could be a few going through there, especially if you're dealing with a correction, right. um, skin tone, eye color. And then at that point, I kind of go, I have a, a lot of great ideas uh, that for your hair color, but please tell me what you have in mind. And also hopefully like uh, they have an inspiration photo so mm-hmm. that I can kind of see where we want to go and if it's even doable, right? you know, based on the information I've gathered thus far. Great. Yeah. So that's how you start it, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's great. kind of my, my first, you got to know what you're working with. Set up. The setup. We yes, call that the setup. Exactly. Uh, I do a setup much like that. Um, I believe consultation is the first step, especially with a new client, in establishing credibility and establishing who will control the relationship. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, here's the thing I find in our industry is that a lot of us acquiesce at the initial introduction point because we have big hearts and we've, we're in the service business and we want to serve them. So we kind of give them control of the relationship. And that's kind of like letting my seven-year-old drive the car. You know, it's like, <laughs> because number one, I'm naturally assuming that, and I, and I, and I do that. I underestimate them on purpose. I assume that they don't have the same knowledge about, hair color, about skin tone, about face shape, and all of that that I do, because I live and breathe that every day. Mm -hmm. And so I approach it as though I am their consultant, because if you look up the definition of consultation, it means the sharing of advice, the exchange of ideas, and the giving of advice. And I think one of the things that we do as hairdressers, because we want to do the best for them, and for some of us, because sometimes we just don't know what our starting point is. We ask them to give us direction. In other words, what would you like today? (laughs) And then they, sometimes they go completely off the reservation. So the first thing I do is introduce myself to a client. I say to them, first of all, I want to take a few minutes before we start today so that I can explain your journey. And so you can maximize your visit while you're here today. So I give them what I want to do. Um, and I also want to give them a preview of what the day is going to hold. I also want them to be able to maximize. That's their what if, you know, their what's in it for me. You're going to be able to maximize Mm -hmm. your visit while you're here today. So I say, first of all, let me tell you what I see, you know, and then I tell them, I I go through the same thing you do, skin analysis. And yes, we have spray tan. There's people here that want to have be tan all year long. Uh, There are people here who spray tan, and they go nuts on the spray tan and they, they look dis, discolored. But to them, what they see in the mirror is obviously something different than what I see. <laughs> yeah, sometimes but, they look like an Oompa Loom from Oz. Yes, yes. So we talk about skin tone, we talk about their hair texture. You know, I do an analysis of the hair to help me know where I am at. Has it been previously colored? Uh, I can tell that. You know, usually we always say, ask the client if they've colored their hair before. Um, I can try to make an assessment first because you can usually see a line of demarcation if it's been previously colored. Um, You can see where there's may have been a lot of color done on the head of hair. And the reason I want to know the history of that is sometimes clients come in and they ask for a big change. So I'll give you an example. A client comes into the salon She's been having highlights done in another salon for the last couple of years. So now it's time for her highlight retouch. And she comes in and she says, I want you to do something completely different. So the regrow from a highlight retouch is about that much. (laughs) So it doesn't matter what I do on that much hair. If her hair is beyond her shoulders, she's never going to see it. Right. So 
when they come in and they want something completely different, that means this is a color correction. We have to start over. We have to clean your canvas. We have to clear the, clear the decks so that whatever I put in there as color placement, you'll be able to see it. So that's why it's important to know what that history is. I never ask someone if they color their hair at home. And the only reason I don't do that is I think it's a really a negative statement because consumers know that we don't like it if they color their hair at home. I mean, you can hear many of people in our industry go on rants about how terrible box hair color is. And of course, we've talked about this, Max, on the show, that <laughs> you guys stop talking about how bad box hair color is because there's people who have beautiful results with box hair color. So you don't want to end up being embarrassed. Uh, so I just mm -hmm. say, tell me about your last color experience. So that kind of opens it up. To me, that's more open. Well, my last color experience, I bought it at CVS or my sister and I were having wine and we decided to color our hair. I find there's a correlation between drinking wine and coloring hair. I don't know. I don't know what that is, but, but it happens. <clears throat> so then I explain to them what I see. I talk about their skin tone. I talk about their face shape. Uh, in that first few minutes, I'm talking about a face shape. I'm talking about their hair and, I, I, and I'm trying to share with them what I envision for them. And I always finish it by saying this statement. There are specific products you will be required to use on your hair between salon visits in order to maintain that color. I'm going to use these products during your visit here today. And I'm going to have your home care regimen waiting for you at the front desk when you leave so you can keep your hair looking as beautiful as it will look at the end of the service between your salon visits. I don't ask them to decide whether they want to use the products. I tell them they're required to use the products. And the reason for that is because I don't know what they're using at home. I don't know of all the different shampoos that are in the drugstore and they all use the same language. I mean, you can walk into CVS and find a shampoo that has quinoa protein in it. You can walk into, you know what I mean? It's like the language is the same. So yeah. they don't know the difference. So, so that's how we set that up. Now, at the end of that statement, I say to them, so what were you thinking about today? So what I've done, if you think about it, is I've already driven the conversation towards what I think she should have. And so that's the way that I do my setup for color. I also, when clients are, don't bring an inspiration picture to with them. I never show a client a swatch card. <laughs> never. We have books that are broken down into brunettes, blondes, redheads, brown reds, mahogany reds, and that's what they look through, a catalog, because sometimes their vocabulary is not the same vocabulary that we use. And you, we can just simply have a misinterpretation just because of the words that they say. For example, I have clients from the Middle East. And those clients natural level are level two, <laughs> level one, level minus one. I have a client who's from Egypt and her hair is darker than black. I mean, I know there's no such thing as darker than black, but that's how dark a black it is. So those clients will come in and say, I want to be ash brown, you know, medium ash brown. So they want to be a level four or a level five neutral brown. But they have so much warm pigment in their hair that when you go to lighten it, it's going to be screaming warmth. And they don't care. Their version of ash brown is even if they see green, they're okay with that. That's what an ash brown will look like to them. If they don't see green in the result, they think that the hair is still too warm because that's what they've been taught that an ash brown is. So right. that's why it's important to get yourself on track for that. So that that's my setup. So you see, we're really pretty similar in what we do. Okay, so now what do you do next? Once you guys have come, and come to a goal, now what are you going to do? 
So at that point is when I, so we've agreed on, you know, what we can and can't do. And we've got our dream shade. I then kind of excuse myself and go into uh, my little color mixing area where I typically keep a pen and a paper and I write everything out. And then I start to actually determine my formula, you know, natural level, percentage of white, desired level, yeah. you know, desired tone. And, you know, can I get there with color? Can I get there with lightener? And if I'm going to, if I'm going to get there with lightener, um, what I'm going to tone with, you know, and just kind of like get myself really situated <clears throat> and, you know, down on paper and, you know, like I kind of cross check everything with, um, you know, a little color mapping Mm -hmm. And, you know, just make sure that what I'm going to select, you know, works out, right, you know, uh, mathematically. And then, you know, I go to town. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, a great thing to do. I, I recommend that everyone, you know, when you go back to formulate that sit down and take a notepad and write down what you plan on doing. You know, it, it's all great. Sometimes things sound really good in our head. <laughs> but they're not so good when we finish with them. So I would just write down, I would write down exactly, you know, what, what level of hair am I beginning with? What is that hair going to contribute at the, at the finished result? Because remember the hair, what the hair contributes is going to make up 50% of my result. So I have to make sure that whatever I'm mixing, you know, if I'm going to be, countering what the hair is contributing i have to make sure whatever i'm mixing is going to be able to do that so it's great to see it on writing my friend of mine used to always say don't think it ink it because when you write it down then you can have a visual of of what your plan is or what your strategy is i think so many of us don't have a strategy when we start coloring hair we just jump into it i mean and and that's the thing I think that causes us to go sideways on our results so many times. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, I always think this about hair color and you hear me say this over and over and, you know, Max, you and I talked about this before we started the show today, that sometimes we just have to keep driving the same information home to people totally. until they really understand it. Because <laughs> When we get to the later part of the show, you guys are going to be going, oh, my God, it's still around. Yeah, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so I always remember this about hair color. Whatever color brand you use, if it's a blended hair color, remember that it always will have a combination of three properties, sometimes only two, but most often it will have three properties. It will have background and background is the foundation of the color. Every hair color that's blended has background. Background is something we don't talk about. We talk about the tone. We don't talk about the background. Backgrounds are usually brown or gray or brown and gray, <laughs> a combination. And then it has tone. Tone is usually the color we're trying to achieve. If I'm trying to achieve a copper blonde, I know that I'm talking about copper. So copper is going to live in the tone section. So I want to make sure if I want it to be a bright copper blonde that I have enough tone and the third component, the third property, reflect, so that it will be a brighter color and it won't be so subdued or so flat. So I have to consider how much background's in my color. How much background's in my formula? Am I adding more than one color in my formula? There's nothing wrong with doing two colors. When you start getting to three colors, I'm concerned. When you start using four colors, I'm sorry. You are defeating everything you've been trying to create. Now, I know there are people who use four different shades of color in a formula, and they love their results. And for those people, I'm going to tell you, you could probably have got, gotten the same result using one shade, maybe two. So it would be important for you to think down, what can I eliminate from my formula to create that same result? Because the more background that I have in my formula, the more flat and drab my result will be. So I always ask myself, 
how much background, how much tone, and how much reflect. What do I need to create the result that I'm looking for? Is there any gray hair involved in this? Okay, if there is, then I may have to consider that based upon what my goal is. You know, I mean, if, if they've got 10% gray, that's not going to make a big difference. I can still consider it, but I wouldn't necessarily, you know, have it have a huge effect on how I formulate my hair color. And then I ask myself, what volume of developer do I need in order to create the level of lightness that I'm trying to achieve? You know, do I need standard 20 volume or do I need something else? And usually if I need a higher volume to create that result, I'm probably going to need to change the level of color that I'm using in my formula in addition to that, because lift, <laughs> well, if you please be clear on this, we'll talk about it in a little bit. Lift is not the responsibility of only one part of your color formula. Lift is the responsibility of both parts of your color formula. It is the marriage of the two that creates lift. And we'll talk about that more later. So that's how I formulate. And of course I do color mapping and I don't want to get into that here today because <laughs> it would be craziness. But just to give you a slice of what color mapping is, color mapping is thinking of the color wheel in a different way. In other words, instead of thinking of thinking of it in whole colors, like blue, red, violet, green, yellow, orange, red, orange, instead of thinking of it like that, I think of it in parts. In other words, what are the parts to the color blue? Well, there's only one part, it's blue. What are the parts in violet? That's blue and red. So it's a blue red for me. What are the parts in copper? Well, copper in my world is red orange. Okay, so that's two parts of red and one part of yellow. So in my brain, I always think in color as parts, not as a whole color. Like for me, brown is not brown. Brown is one blue, two reds, three yellows. One blue, two reds, three yellows. One, two, three. One blue, two reds, three yellows. <laughs> so that's my formulation. That's how I, how I do it. And then I mix that puppy up and take that out in the salon. And normally, I don't really mix in the back. I mix on my trolley because usually I don't do one formula for an entire head. I usually do more than one formula. So I take the whole hair design and as a colorist, when I play that role of a colorist, I'm telling the story of the design. So most of my colors are more than one formula, not in the bowl, but on the head. Why is that? Well, first of all, it's part of art. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, if their head is too wide, I can put a deeper shade or a cooler shade and I can make it visually look narrow or more narrow simply because of where I apply my color. If, if their crown, that's our watchdog, if our crown is really flat, I can put a lighter color in that portion of the head shape and light will widen. So the light will make that crown area look actually more ovalized, not so flat against her head. So you can do that with color placement. Color placement visually can change the shape, just like cutting can physically change the shape. So, so that's the way I approach it before I put it on the head and go out there and start my application. So now we're at application, Max. Now what? You get that junk on there. <laughs> get that junk on there. Absolutely. And uh, a couple of things I recommend that you keep in mind. The minute you mix the color in the bowl, development, dye development begins. The party has started. Party has started. So based upon how fast you apply uh, and based upon what you're working with, 
you may have to mix as you go. If you're working on a head of hair that's really thick, that's going to take you a while for application. And here's why. Because dye development has already began in the bowl, there are some of those partially developed dyes that you'll be picking up in your brush and applying on the head that will never find their way to the cortex because they are too large to penetrate between the cuticle layers. Remember, that's where color works. It works between the cuticle layers. So they'll be too large. They'll get stuck in those cuticle layers and um, they'll, they'll partially develop in that area. So it's important for you to think about how much time, I mean, you don't have to go nuts the way you apply it, but always, do I have to mix? It's okay to mix as you go. Uh, I find sometimes we try to make a color do more than it possibly can. Because remember, every hair color has a processing cycle. The processing cycle is usually measured in an you know, amount of minutes. So if I'm still doing application at the last 10 minutes of the processing cycle, does it make sense to you that I'm going to be losing something from that color mixture? So that's why mixing as I go makes it a, a a really a, a larger benefit for me. Definitely. Max, how about you? Um, pretty much a kind of the same, really. You know, yeah. um, for me, I tend to do a lot more um, dimensional type applications mm -hmm. in the salon here. So I'm typically dealing with multiple bowls of right. things, you know, like usually a lightener, maybe a high lift or like a mid, you know, like tube color highlight and normally a low light with right. like a demi. So I tend to mix small batches, mm. you know, so, Absolutely. so, so typically every quadrant, mm -hmm. I just mix up enough for that quadrant and then remix and it just, you know, really guarantees me a nice even processing time. And, you know, I'm always mindful of the time too. So like if I finish wrapping one quadrant of the back, you know, I'm looking at my watch so that, you know, when I go back and check if the lightener's done, but enough time hasn't elapsed as far as processing for my low lights or my high lift or whatever might be in another foil, then I know I can just pull out those lightener foils and wipe those down and right. let everything else continue. Right. You know, cause there's nothing worse than uh, pulling something off that's under processed, right. especially, you know, uh, like a high lift and then the hair is just like, you know, Ronald McDonald or something. Yeah. Well, I heard someone say that. They said that they uh, they always prepare themselves to to accept what they get. <laughs> Possibly they won't achieve it. So, but I'm always mentally prepared to accept what I get and to call it dimensional. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, I thought, that is, I've never heard anybody <laughs> say that. <laughs> I'm preparing for failure. And so I'm, I'm, I'm setting myself up so I know what to say when we don't achieve the result we were trying to achieve. That's craziness. But, you know, I, I think that's what happens a lot of times. Like, like for me, when I get that color applied, and to me, application is such an important thing. I mean, <laughs> I have worked with hairdressers that when they finish a color application, it looks like that client has been in a major car accident. They have color everywhere, running down the side of her cheek. Oh uh, they have created her an artificial hairline. So she looks like Eddie Munster on the Munsters. Um, and then, of course, when they go to rinse that, because the, the color has stained the skin, now they're trying to, they have this product called No, no Rub. And it actually should be rubbed like you're going nuts because <laughs> it will not remove that stain from the skin. Uh, it's very difficult to do that. Don't, don't forget the cigarette ashes. Oh, that's what I was just going to say. And then they start cussing because nobody smokes anymore in the salon. And they go, dang, I wish I had some cigarettes. And I'm just going, oh, my God. But it's, 
you don't have to do that. That doesn't have to happen to you if you do an application properly. See, I, when I do a color class and we do hands-on, I always hold up the color brush and I say, see these? These are called bristles. This is where you load the product on the brush. Down here on the handle, this is called the handle. <laughs> you don't want color on the handle. You have no control over that. <clears throat> so I think application is an important thing. Like when I do my application, I always start from the back of the head and I work forward. I learned that when I was teaching in Asia. Because the Asians, their applications, man, they get it on the hair fast. And they always start in the back. And I said, why do you do that? And they said, well, because it's much easier. And you can start in the back, work forward. All the hair is coming back off the face. Yeah, off the so face. the client doesn't have all this hair falling on her face. And we don't end up getting her ears, you know, where they're all stained and, and all of that. And I thought, wow, teach me how to do this. And they did. And it was amazing. It changed the way I apply hair color completely. <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I think that clients judge the value of a hair color service, not just on the result, but they judge it on the experience. So if, if she looks like she's got color stains everywhere, okay, I mean, she's already devaluing, you know, the service. And she's oh, yeah. going to be offended if you charge a premium price and yet she's walking out with stains on her skin. So uh, I really, really, that, that drives me crazy. The it's, only thing that drives me more crazy than that is when people can't cut foils the proper size. <laughs> I hate that. Row. <laughs> well, my foils are always the size of a permanent wave rod. Now here's why. Permanent wave rods are about the, the appropriate length where you can place them either on a flat of the head or on a curve of the head, and they will fit. Some people take foils that are like six inches wide, and then they end up, they spend the first two minutes of folding everything in. You know, so I try to put them in the, so that I can get more foil in the head if necessary. Even with my balayage, <coughs> I take that into consideration as well. It's like, am I painting across two bevels of the head shape? Then it's going to change the way the hair falls. So, so, so some of those things are real, real important. But in application, I think the cleaner the application, the better. And, um, Actually, do you know if you start in the back, what I learned was that you can actually do that without wearing gloves. I don't recommend you do that, but you can because you're not going to get crap all over your hands. Yeah. You're not yeah. flipping hair over the no, head. No, you're not flipping hair or anything. Coming off. Yeah. Yeah. It's so definitely I, yeah. all about those little details, you know, at that, yes. I, I feel like clients really appreciate them, you know, like even just down to putting a little barrier cream on their forehead, on top yeah. of their ears, you know, having those little, which I wish I invented them. Oh, the glass clips. things for your glasses, right? Yeah, man. We've people, got those. Yeah, they love them. Love, love those, you know, right. getting that hairline color off, you right. know, at the shampoo bowl, like dealing with that first. Right. And even too, like when I, when I gloss my clients, even if I'm not putting them, under any kind of heat source after I've got the the glaze applied I always put coil cotton around yeah. their hairline yeah yeah just so that nothing's running down their face because those products tend to be a little bit well a lot looser. of those a lot of those glosses are real liquid they're yep. more liquid in form than they are cream so it's good to put a little barrier there so so anything that you do like that just shows for me it just shows that you're concerned about making the experience the best experience they can have. And the same thing is when we apply to long hair, we have plastic capes mm -hmm. that we wrap around them and the cape falls all the way across, you know, their back and down over the chair. So if I have to paint hair that's 22 inches long, sure. I'm not worried about it laying against my chair. I'm not worried about the client leaning forward and then leaning back, you know, and then squashing everything, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, we just try to make it a, a good experience for them. Yeah. So 
then once the application's on for me, uh, processing time is important. Now, Max, I'm a double booker. I'm actually a triple booker on occasion. But of course, with COVID, that's changed a lot. But mm -hmm. that's the way I was raised. You know, if you want to be productive, you work two chairs. You don't work one. And so for me, I would set the client over there. And, and the funny thing is, is there's people who believe, well, if you're not spending all that time with your client, you can't make them feel special. I disagree. I disagree. Because for us, every client felt special. Well, they were in processing. Other people were in processing. They were all taken care of. <clears throat> but it allowed me then time to do something else to see another client. I'm more productive. You know, if, if I have a client and she's sitting there and I have, let's say that I'm, I'm using something that's going to make her processing time only 10 minutes. That's a great thing. You know, it would be great if she were my only client. But it's terrible if she's not my only client right. because there's nothing I can do in 10 minutes that will help me be productive, generating revenue. And so that's why I'm glad hair color takes 30 minutes to process. <laughs> I'm glad of all that because I'm, I'm more productive for the hours that I'm in the salon. Sure, and so I let her process. And then we come to the end, right? The end, almost the end. It's not yet the end. Okay, it's time to check the color. Do you know how many people don't check their color? They hear the timer go bing, and they run them to the shampoo bowl, and they start shampooing the hair. Wait a minute. Did you, did you take a moment and check to see if it colored the hair? Are there any challenges that you have? <laughs> did one area not take as well? This is that moment in time. This is the time to, I call it the adjustment phase. Mm -hmm. So I check to see, is it red enough? Good. Is it too flat? You know, is there anything that, that's happened to it? I can adjust it before I take it off the head. So I think people think timers mean colors finished. Timer simply means, hey, check your color. So if the color is good, then I take her to the shampoo bowl and I go through what we call a post-oxidation protocol. I don't really, if you just log on to my Facebook page or if you log on to my Instagram page, you'll see I just did a big board on that yesterday. So I'm not going to walk through all that in this video, but there is a protocol that I use and Max uses that protocol as well, that assures that you're bringing the hair back into the optimum pH range of where it loves to live the best. And you're also eliminating and stopping any oxidation that might have continued with a poor post-oxidation service. And there's certain steps to it. So I invite you to check the big board out and... Um, and see how those steps look for you. Um, uh, Max, anything you want to share? What would you do as well at the end, at um, the end or to take it down? I call it taking down your color. Yeah, say, um, you know, I, I, I do the Holy Cross. I light an uh, arena. No. <laughs> uh, same post-oxidation service, super important. You know, typically something to that is very acidic after after rinsing to really s try to stop the action right bring you know bring the ph down then a couple of shampoos treatment of your choice you know each but knowing each thing you're doing to the hair is gradually bringing the ph down it isn't like a simple math equation that you know if the hair is at a 9.5 and you put something that is like a pH two, you don't add the two together and divide them by half. Right. You know, it just doesn't work like that. So it's like every little thing you do is helping to bring the pH down from rinsing to applying some kind of acidifier to shampooing multiple times to conditioning, et cetera. Right, right. And so now 
the hair is shampooed. We go on with any other services that are necessary. We finish styling the hair. We're still not done yet in our salon because now we walk them to the front desk. And at the front desk, we present them with their home care regimen. And there's a way we do it. We do not hand the package over the desk. We do the Nordstrom the Nordstrom presentation. In other words, we walk around the desk and face them and hand it to them in their hands so mm-hmm. that it's like we're giving them a gift. I learned that from one of my clients who worked at Nordstrom's who told me this is the way Nordstrom's makes the experience special. And so we do that and we set them up for the next appointment. We pre-book We have to pre-book in this business because if you're not pre-booking, you don't know what your next month's going to give you. You don't know what your, what kind of revenue you're going to be generating. I have heard on social media, there's a rumor going around that people are being, they're being recommended not to pre-book. Why would you do that? Now, do I keep my books full three months out? No, I don't. I purposely leave openings. Why would I do that? Because every once in a while, my client wants to get in brand new and I have some place to put them. I have some place to put them. So for me, it's not being so booked that people have to wait six months to come and see me. It's about being booked for a long period of time, but always having an open space available. You can walk into any hotel in the country today when a hotel is fully booked, holiday weekend. And if you are the right person, if you're insistent enough, many times they can find you a room. How did they find a room if they were fully booked? Because they weren't fully booked. (laughs) Walk into a fine restaurant and, of course, pay a premium they will always find you a table. Mm-hmm. How did they do that if they're fully booked? Because they planned it into their schedule. So then we say goodbye to the client. She's pre-booked. We're not done yet. Three days later, three days later, we call her just to check in on her. Mm-hmm. How are you doing? How's everything working for you? Great, great, good. Okay, excellent. Well, listen, have a great month. We'll see you next time. All right, bye-bye. That's the final touch. That's the final touch. That personal, quick phone call. How are you doing? Now, many people say, "Ah, I don't need to do that. That's great. We do it because that's what's enabled us to have. We have a 83% rebook. So, Clients who rebook with us, over 83% of them pre-book. They pre-book their appointments. So I've only got 17% of my books that are open. Right. That's pretty good because I'm not in Hollywood. I'm not in LA. I'm not in New York. I'm not in Miami Beach. I'm in funky little Upland, California. (laughs) Max, how about you? Uh, again, pretty much the, the same. I do a product prescription. You know, I try to, you know, make my recommendations, <clears throat> get them to touch it. There is something definitely to be yep. said about that, that tactile experience. Yes. Um, and again, you know, pre-book, we do a follow-up email. Yep, you know, ours but, goes out automatic. Yeah, yeah, but same thing. You know, just want to make sure that everything's working out. And it, if in the case, you know, it's not. You know, some people are not necessarily, you know, what I would say, confrontational. Right. So it gives them a chance, you know, away from the space to say, you know, I feel like this tone might be off, or right. you know, I'm not blonde enough, or you know, like in the in the off chance that it happens. I think that it also allows you a chance to salvage it. Cause a lot of times some people will just not come back, you know, cause right. they don't, 
they don't want to say, you know, they're not sure about it or, you know. Right. Right. No, you're absolutely right, Max. And uh, business classes, they teach you that. Yeah. If you can't have at least three, you know, you want to get those first three contacts Mm -hmm. in with a new client as soon as you can. Yeah. Because that gives you three times to come together to build on that relationship. If you do that, the sooner you do that, then the more you ensure the chance of that becoming a client who will be loyal and stay with you for years. Yeah, for sure. So So it's, it's kind of the same here. And, you know, I don't know about you, Dennis, but I'm, I'm always accepting new clients. Absolutely. this, This whole thing on social media, not accepting new clients. I'm like, how, (laughs) how are you going to, don't you want to raise your prices and have people pay you more money for that highlight as opposed to the ones that will drop off when you, you know, right. Well, tell Gordon Ramsay that he should not accept new people. (laughs) These people say, what are you crazy? But anyway, well, hey, listen, it looks like we've gone full term on this little video. So this is probably going to have to be a part two. Uh, All right. um, If you've enjoyed this, uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, You can find that right here below us. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can find Max and I on Instagram. You can find Max at Max M Hair. You can find me at Real Captain Color. We also invite you to visit our website, which is www.gurunation.net. And you can take a look at the education that we offer there. We have online videos you can download. We also have virtual classes uh, going on throughout the year. So um, we thank you so much. Hopefully you found this beneficial. Uh, We wanted to spend some time today talking about, so you get an idea about how we work. And I want you to understand that we both still work behind the chair. I I believe so much that you have to have a hands-in approach in this industry, especially if you're going to be a trainer or a teacher, because if you lose that connection of those real life stories in your salon, it doesn't make you credible a lot of, a lot of times. And you may not know it if you're a trainer watching this, but they recognize that they can see that you can't hide it. You cannot hide it. They can feel it. So uh, that's why it's about, you know, what happens in the salon. And so if you have any other questions that uh, about how we approach hair color applications and techniques, uh, please send us a note. Uh, reach out to us. Um, anything that, that you would like. We want to thank you all so much that have been uh, encouraging us in this program. We try to make it beneficial. Uh, we set goals every week so that you kind of know where we want to go with this program. So it's not just idle chatter. And uh, if it's been beneficial, share it with your friends. But in any case, uh oh, uh, there's our ride, Max. Mm. Okay, brother, listen, I'll see you in the clearing shortly. Uh, We'll come back and we'll do a part two. We'll get that out in the next day or two. In any case, everybody have a wonderful Valentine's Day. And as always, from my heart to yours, I'm Captain Color. I'm out. Max, how about you? I'm out of here. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you all. Take care. Have a great day.